Hi everyone, welcome back to Pine Hollow Auto Diagnostics. Today in the shop we have a Mint 2002 Toyota Avalon uh, with the legendary 1MZ power plant, the V6. This thing is top of the line, beautiful shape. The only customer complaint here at 126,000 miles is he has a parasitic draw. He says he lets the car sit for maybe a week up to two weeks and it barely cranks. Still starts up so it sounds like a small parasitic draw but nevertheless it's annoying. Uh, he has another Avalon uh, 2002, uh, 2003 that doesn't have a parasitic draw and that one you can let sit for a month and it'll start right up. So you can see here he's got his you know battery maintainer leads tied on there. He's been dealing with this problem for a while. He said the battery is fairly fresh, it's, it's a few years old from 2019 and he just wants the problem fixed. He said it's annoying to hook up the battery charger every time he leaves the car for more than a few days so let's diagnose it. So right now the car's asleep, ignition keys out, doors are closed. Let's hook up an in-series meter and see if there is a parasitic draw right now at the moment. So for this measurement I'm using the Astro AI. This is a fantastic value. Uh, big screen and it does everything you want. So we're, we're going to the amp port, amp and com. Set it to the amp scale, make sure it's zero. And now I'm going to hook this up to the negative battery cable. Let's put this right here. And loosen up the clamp. So you want one side on the wire. And the other side, once you lift up the terminal, you don't want to wake the car up. Slide your other clamp underneath and attach it to the battery post. Now you can lift this off, put it to the side, and we see 189 milliamps. So about 190 milliamps. That's way too high. For comparison, I measured the parasitic draw on his 2003 Avalon, and that one was 20 milliamps. 20 is a good number, somewhere between 10 and 20, depending how fancy your car is, how many modules it has. Um, you know, that's that's reasonable. This one is almost at 200, so it's 10 times the allowable good number. So there's definitely a draw. Where do we start? Well, let's start right at this main fuse box and measure the voltage drops on all the accessible small fuses. Uh, let me get my multimeter. Okay, so for the voltage drop measurements, we're measuring voltage drops across the fuse. If there's any current running through any one of these fuses, we'll see a very small voltage drop on our meter. This is an old school Beckman industrial meter, just a simple, you know, two probes, and that's really handy for these voltage drop checks across fuses. So, let's just start from here. You see 0.0, .0 millivolts, there's no draw through that fuse. That one, again zero. So I already checked all the fuses, and the only one that had any draw was this 30 amp. Let's see, 0 0.2 millivolts across this 30 amp fuse. So the bigger the fuse rating, the smaller the voltage drop, obviously, but there, it's not zero. You want to see 0.0. .0. Okay, so now that's the only small fuse that has a draw and I'm just going to pull it because on old cars you don't need to wait 40 minutes for it to go to sleep. This thing goes to sleep in you know under a minute so it's not going to be time consuming if we pull a fuse and wake the car up or something. Let me pull that fuse And we'll see on the meter if the draw goes to, you know, closer to zero. Boom. Six milliamps. So that this is definitely our culprit. And let's put it back in, see what happens. 
we're at 0.8. I can hear the CD changer doing something. Let's just wait a while. Now it's 20 milliamps, just like the other car. Very interesting. <laughs> so, something wasn't asleep. I pulled that fuse, put it back in, and something went to sleep. So what's the next step? We need to see what this fuse feeds. Now it is the 30 amp right here. It's labeled DCC. I have no idea what DCC is. For that we need to go to OEM wiring diagrams and see where that goes. Okay, so we have our vehicle pulled up on all data. Power distribution diagrams. Oh, these are the non-OE but they're handy because they actually tell you where each fuse goes, what it feeds. <clears throat> so let's find DCC. Okay, right there. DCC 30 amp in the engine room fuse box. And that feeds ECU B, radio, and dome fuse in under the dash fuse box. Okay. So we pull that fuse put it in and the car went to sleep. It went from 200 milliamps to 20. Very interesting. So this is hot at all times. We can see that it comes from A, right up here from, there's the battery, boom. So that's hot at all times. That's the main power feed to the radio, ECUB, and dome fuse. Okay. So now we need to go under the dash, let the car go to sleep, you know, we'll see the parasitic draw again, and measure the voltage drop across these three fuses to narrow it down further. That's our next step. Okay, so we have our 20 milliamps, how do we reproduce the parasitic draw? I think it's as easy as turning the ignition key. Well, let's try to first turn it to accessory. Turn on our radio. Today, maybe. And turn it back off. Close the door. And see how fast this thing goes to sleep and if it goes back to the parasitic draw or if it goes back down to 20 milliamps. I love how fast older cars go to sleep. It makes parasitic draw testing actually fun instead of annoying, <laughs> time consuming. So Fords are the worst of going to sleep really slowly. Okay, so we're already less than the 200 milliamps and I assume it's gonna drop down to 20 very quickly. There you go. So less than like 30 seconds. So turning the key to accessory and back off did not reproduce the draw. Let's turn it to ignition to on. Okay, so now our cluster is alive and fancy display there. Turn it back off. We'll watch that again. And so point three seven. <clears throat> Okay, this time we have 226 milliamps. Oh, 0.3, 0 0.25. Let's wait a little bit. 
Okay, so that's it. So after one ignition cycle, parasitic draw came back. So now, okay, there we go. It finally went to 190, which where it was when the car was asleep, like long term. <clears throat> so now what I want to do, open up the door, press the button to make the car think that the door is closed. Then we'll go right to the fuse box under the dash and measure those three fuses that this 30 amp DCC fuse feeds with our multimeter, measure the voltage drop on those fuses, and uh, go from there. All right, the door's open. I'm gonna install a clamp right on this door jam button. So our dome lights should go off. And the fuse box is right here. We have a nice label. Dome lights are off. Okay, so now we're going for those three fuses, which was radio, ECUB, and dome. Dome lights right there. Dome, radio, ECUB. Let's measure the voltage drop on those. All right, let's measure the voltage drop on these fuses using our meter. So the first one is dome, which is right here. You can see the meter there. Let me put my leads on the fuse. easier doing this with two hands. 0, 0.00, okay. Next one is ECUB, which is the same row. Okay, so zero, maybe 0 0.1, okay, so minimal. Last one is radio. Okay, not zero. 0. 0.6 millivolts. So the radio fuse. Interesting. Now let's do the same procedure. So we have 190 milliamps. Let's pull this radio fuse. So right here, this 15 amp. Pull that out. We go to 17 milliamps. That's good. So now we've narrowed down that our draw goes through the DCC fuse, through the radio fuse, and what does the radio fuse feed? Well, it's not just the radio, it's radio, stereo component amplifier, and multi display. Okay, so those three components, and keep in mind that the parasitic draw only happens after an ignition on key cycle, not accessory. So can we determine that using that fact if it's the radio, the amplifier, or the multi-display? Let's take a look at more wiring diagrams. So here's the diagram for the radio player. This has the fancy seven speaker system. You can see the power feeds are the radio fuse, hot at all times, and then the ECU ACC, which is just an accessory position. That makes sense. So just two power feeds there, and then here's a stereo component amplifier, and those have the same two power feeds. That makes sense. And that is it for the power feeds. So I can say right now, since the parasitic draw does not happen when you just turn in the key to accessory and back off, the problem is going to be in the multi-display. Let's take a look at the diagram for that unit. Okay, so this is our combination meter so it's the whole cluster assembly plus that whatever date and time fuel economy display it's all in one unit it's called a multi display and let's look at the power feeds for that unit so it has some warning lights not really interested in that we're interested in the logic 
circuits in here. Charge, buttons, now here we go. We have the radio fuse. That's hot at all times. Accessory fuse, you know, hot and accessory. And you see this power supply box right here. And then this yellow and red, I assume, that's going to be our ignition source. So follow it through. Yep, ECU ignition. So whenever you turn the key to ignition, this sucker wakes up, and when you turn the key off and take it out, it does not fully power down and draws 200 milliamps. When we remove the constant power fuse and put it back in, it does go to sleep, and then everything's fine. So at this point, the problem we can say definitively is in the multi display unit, and you know that's causing the parasitic draw. Now, what are the solutions to this problem? Replacing the whole cluster on this car, I don't think it's going to happen. I talked to the customer, he's like, you know, if you really need to install a battery kill switch, it's not his primary vehicle. He only drives it maybe a couple times a week. I'm like, well, that's not the most elegant solution. Can we think of some trick so that constant battery power maybe make it an accessory or ignition power now it does feed the radio so you do want when you turn the key to accessory so the radio powers up obviously um, so can we make that fuse the radio fuse instead of constant battery power switch it to an accessory power will that work let's try that temporarily and see how the system behaves I assume that if the cluster doesn't have constant battery power, it'll lose the time and the date. Now, is that a big deal? No, a customer says it's not a big deal. So, he just wants to get rid of the parasitic draw without spending thousands of dollars on whatever, a used cluster and tearing the whole car apart. So, let's, uh, let's try making that fuse an accessory power instead of constant battery power. So let's first try turning the ignition key on with that radio fuse out and see how this multi-display works. So key on, the needles do something funky, self-calibrate. Does our multi-display turn on? All right, it does eventually. Obviously the radio won't work. And <clears throat> we're Friday, January 1st. 1 a.m. everything reset so if we go to mode minute <laughs> so the year is 1999 and I noticed that the maximum year you can put in here is uh, let's see 2015 16 17 18 19 so 2018 is the latest year you can put in here. Shame on Toyota, that's planned obsolescence. They didn't want you to keep this car longer than 20 years. Actually, if it's a 2002, longer than like 17 years, and you can't even put in the right year. Boo. <laughs> so I guess, you know, the, the date you can't set uh, appropriately anyways. But that's... That's how the cluster behaves with that fuse out. If we turn it off, you see the, basically the needles do that weird reset and the screen comes on late. Okay, so let's pull that fuse, it's out right now, and give this fuse a power when the accessory position is on instead of constant battery power. Now where do we find an accessory power here? Back to our wiring diagram, ignition key, so an accessory and on. We have these four fuses, cigarette lighter, SRS accessory, ECU accessory and power outlet. Let's go for the cigarette lighter fuse. We'll pull that out, figure out which pin is hot in accessory and just just jump that to to our 
radio fuse output pin. Okay. Okay, so using a test light to battery ground, first in the radio fuse slot, let's figure out which pin is hot at all times. It's the upper pin. So the lower pin will go to the radio and the multi display. I pulled the SIG um, lighter fuse, and this one, when the key is an accessory, the top pin will be hot, and this one goes to our cigarette lighter. So we want to jump this top pin to that bottom pin as an experiment. And if I turn the key down off, the top pin loses power. Okay, so let's jump those two and see how stuff behaves and look at our parasitic draw, which right now is 18 milliamps. Okay, so jumper is installed through a fuse. Let's turn the key to accessory. Okay, our gauges obviously reset since they didn't have constant battery power. The CD changer does its thing. We can turn on our radio now. And let's, uh, I don't know if it'll keep its memory presets. I doubt it. So 4 is 105.9. You turn the key to it on, then you know that comes on. Everything's good. Everything's happy. Let's turn the key off. Take it out and look at our parasitic draw. It should go down back to less than 20 milliamps. Okay, so in half a minute, we're back down to 17 milliamps. So that is a viable solution if we can somehow get that power and put it to that pin you know through a 15 amp fuse so the only drawbacks are you lose your radio presets and you lose your time on your fancy display the customer said he'd be more than happy with that instead of installing a battery kill switch um, and I guess the needles will do their little reset thing when you turn the key on. But that's what the customer wants, that's what we're gonna do. So let's find out, create an elegant way, because I don't wanna tear the whole dash apart, I just wanna do all the wiring right here at the fuse box to do this permanently. Okay, so here's the game plan. I want to install this fuse holder, so this is gonna be our new radio fuse. This pin I'm going to trim down so uh, just basically cut in half so we'll stick this in the feed to the radio and the cluster and this end is going to be tied to an accessory power coming from the cigarette lighter fuse so I have to figure out how to adapt this to that pin while still having the cigarette lighter fuse in there I was thinking maybe solder on you know, solder this to a leg of a fuse and just shove it in there. Because otherwise you have to run a jumper, and then another fuse holder. This is going to be messy. I just want to make this clean and still usable. Um, you know, I guess we'll, uh, we'll go with the path of least resistance. Alright, so here's the final solution. So this end is just a trimmed uh, male connector crimped onto the fuse holder. That's going to go to our radio pin. And then this is our cigarette lighter fuse. So I just soldered on the strands right there. And that's the accessory power feed. So this still fits and it'll still feed our cigarette lighter. So let's see if it works. Turn on our meter. Here's our key. So our needles do their reset. Radio obviously doesn't keep its presets, but they weren't there to begin with. And make sure our cigarette lighter works. I don't know where that is. Oh, there we go. 
we'll just see if that heats up. Yep, it's warm. So that's the final fix. Key off. Key on. Just has a reset, but the screen will come on eventually, even though it won't be very useful because all this stuff resets, but at least you can see your outside temperature. And final check here with the key off. What is our parasitic draw? Let's wait for that to time out. Okay, 17 milliamps. So customer approved the repair. We'll leave it like that. And that's it. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.